Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you another in their exciting new series of broadcasts on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Each week, Hallmark will bring you two to life stories of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Presented on the Hallmark Hall of Fame by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. You know, I wonder just how many of us fully appreciate our debt to the past. How much we owe to that vast army of unsung men and women who have made America great. Tonight, the Hallmark Hall of Fame pays tribute to one among those many. To a man whose life was rich with action and poignant with great romance. This is the true and moving story of John McDonough, one of the first pioneers of free education for the poor of all ages and creeds. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the card you want to send. Because Hallmark Cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Clark Gable, Gene Tierney starring picture Never Let Me Go with Richard Hayden. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the first act of our Hallmark Hall of Fame. In the city of New Orleans, in Lafayette Square, there stands a certain monument of stone and marble and bronze. It's a simple monument, and yet one dear to the heart of so many generations of the children of New Orleans. A monument to the memory of John McDonough. Who was this man, this John McDonough? Well, it's not a new question. For 150 years, all New Orleans was asking the same question. Who was this young man who had come to New Orleans without a penny and now, not yet 30 years old, was already a rich man? My business, sir? Why, the Mississippi River and everything that floats on it. Flat boats, cotton, tobacco, lumber. Trade is my business, sir, and my only pleasure. But for most of New Orleans, pleasure is the only business anyway. His people still follow the graceful life of the French and the Spanish who governed their city. It's a gay, carefree life, unknown to John McDonough, unknown until one certain evening. <laughs> Senor Almanaste, may I present my friend, Miss McDonough. John, your host is Donna Maria Almanaste Rojas. I'm honored, Senora. I've heard much about you, Senor McDonough. Of your wealth, your fine house, your riding horses, the number of plantations which you own, and yet the reports have done you an injustice. In what way, senora? You are also answer. <laughs> you see, at my age, a woman can afford to be frank. And also very generous. Tell me, senor McDonald, why is it that you take no part in the society of our city, huh? I'm a man of business, senora, by day and by night. But all of life is not the making of money, senor McDonald. What will you do with your riches? Perhaps... I can answer that by asking what your late husband, the Governor General, did with his. He gave to New Orleans a school, a hospital, a church. So, that is your ambition. You ought to be complimented, sir. Please, senor. <laughs> Very well, we shall talk of other things. Ah, but wait, you have not met my daughter. Yes, mama. Senor McDonough, my daughter Isabella. Senor McDonough, my daughter Isabella. I am delighted, senor. How do you do? With your permission, senorita, perhaps you would grace my arm? 
this dance, please? With pleasure. For one time, Mama, you are wrong. Forgive my curiosity, senorita, but I heard you say to your mother... Yes, she is quite wrong. Not all men of the United States are without charm. There are other social events, balls, dinner parties, receptions, and at each of them, John McDonough seeks for the sight of one person, the exquisite Isabella. But she's never alone. There's always the duenna, the ever alert chaperone of every Spanish girl of high degree. Then, one afternoon at a garden party, Isabella's duenna turns her back for a moment. Only a moment, but still enough. Isabella, quickly. But where? Out of the gate, hurry. Oh. John, your carriage. Yes, I had it stationed here all afternoon just on the chance. Oh, no, 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 we should not. And yet we will. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Cassius, give him the whip. John, what has come over us? People are sure to see us. Let them. This is the United States, Isabella. There's nothing wrong with a young lady and a gentleman taking a carriage ride together. Oh, but seriously. Isabella, I'm not going to propose to you in front of your duenna. John. Darling, there's no point of hiding it longer. You, you must have read it in my eyes. I love you. And I... Oh, querido mío. There could never be anyone else in the world for me, Isabella. To be my wife, to be the mother of my children. My darling. Oh, children. And you would make such a wonderful father. Children mean much to you, don't they? Of course they do. They stand for the future. It's the children of today will make the America of tomorrow. Oh, Isabella. Wait, darling, say no more, please. Why? You forget that we Spanish are a people of customs. They must be observed. You and I cannot talk of marriage until you have first spoken to my mother. All right. Then today, this very evening, true to his promise, that evening, John McDonough called to the mansion of Donna Maria Almonas de Uras. Isabella's mother listens to John's declaration and then... Senor McDonough, I do not doubt your affection for my daughter, nor hers for you, but please permit me one question. Of course. To have much to offer a wife, and will have even more in the future. But it is of your past that I wish to inquire. What of those years before you came to New Orleans? I am not ashamed of them, Senora. I was born in Baltimore. Poor parents. There was little chance for schooling. As a boy, I was a street peddler. But even then, I had ambitions. Now they are realized. Yes? Well, fine plantation. The splendid town house. Which I have taken the liberty to redecorate, Senora, as a wedding present for Isabella. So, Senor McDonald. I fear that you have presumed too much. But, Senor Almonaster... Please, sir. remember that Isabella is the daughter of His Spanish Majesty's late Governor General of Louisiana. She is of the houses of Almonaster y Rojas. Blood must equal blood. Degree equal degree. Senora, I am an American, and we care little for titles of nobility. Just as we have Spain, regard them highly. I'm sorry, Senor McDonough, but no, it cannot be. Oh, then I'm sorry, too, Senora, for I'm sure that Isabella will decide otherwise. She will decide as I wish her to decide. Isabella... Forgive me, I overheard. Darling, tell your mother that she can't stop us. I'm sorry, darling. My mother is still my mother. It is also true that you and I are of different worlds. Isabella. Penny McDonough, one moment. Yes? Perhaps I should have been more frank with you. And Isabella. I have already received a proposal for my daughter's hand, which I shall accept. He is of noble birth. The Marquis de Frontenac. Oh, Therefore, Senor McDonough, you will neither see nor write to Isabella again. You may consider that you and she have already spoken your last farewells. Stunned and heartbroken, John McDonough returns to his fine town house. The house which he'll never share with Isabella. The 
The next day, he called his attorney to him, and together they walked from one ornate room to another. You know, I've always admired this parlor, but now the way you've redecorated it, John, it's simply magnificent. Let's go into the music room. Here. It's for you. What? The key to the parlor. But uh, I don't understand. Over there, that's a piano I ordered from New York. It's never been played. John. Who here, please? Keep this key also. Oh, John, where are your servants? I discharge them. Oh, then that's it. Where are you going? Across the river. To my plantation. The front door key, Mr. Wilkins. The place is yours to sell. John. Sell it for whatever you can get. I'm not coming back. John, you just can't turn your back on New Orleans. It's, it's been very kind to you. Huh. Also very cruel. Strawberry, sir? Fresh strawberry, gentlemen? No, no. Uh, go on. Wait one you. moment. Son, what are you doing with this push cart? You're too young to be working. I'm ten, sir. <laughs> and you, my dear? Eight, sir. Ten and eight. Oh, you both should be in school. But schools cost money, sir. Our family is very poor. And there's no school to go to anyway. I know. Only for the rich. Well, here, I'll take some strawberries. Oh, thank you, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Bye. Boy and a girl on a push cart. John. Yes? I've been thinking. Perhaps I do know why you've given up this house. Why you want to turn away from life. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you do, Mr. Wilkins. But you're wrong, John. Even without love, you still have much to live for. Yes. Yes, I'm just beginning to understand that. To remember that there is something for me to do. Something important for the children. And the future. In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Have you often wished for a way to keep the children busy and to teach them the wonderful spirit of thoughtfulness, too? Well, tonight I want to tell you about Hallmark May Baskets because I feel sure they'll help you accomplish both those wishes at the same time. You see, Hallmark May Baskets are pretty colorful baskets that your boys and girls can put together right in your own living room or playroom. They come flattened out so that busy little fingers can punch out the designs and fold and lock the tabs attached to each Hallmark May Basket to each Hallmark May basket. Even the tiniest tot can join in the fun, for no scissors or glue are needed to turn out perfect Hallmark May baskets. Yes, and here's something that's nice to know. Hallmark May baskets cost just 50 cents for a whole set of five different styles. Once they're made, the little folks can put a few candies or nuts in each basket and deliver them to their favorite friends. You'll find Hallmark May baskets at a fine store where Hallmark cards are sold. Just look for the Hallmark and crown on the package, the symbol that always means you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of John McDonough. Disappointed in love, John McDonough turns away from the social life of the city of New Orleans and pours all of his energy into business. The making of money seems to become his sole concern. So it seems to those who can only look on and guess at his purposes. One such man is Wilkins, McDonough's attorney. John, you're driving yourself too hard. There's no need to work day and night. Mr. Courtney, bring me those bills of laden. Harrison, I need those invoices right away. John, you haven't heard a word I've said. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilkins. I'd have more time for conversation if I could get enough proper help around here. Well, then, hire it. Yeah, where will I find it? I'm expanding, but 
Not as fast as I could if I had the right sort of men. Men with education. From my experience, education simply isn't keeping up with the times. Well, I'd say you've done all right. From what I've heard, you hardly ever saw the inside of a school book. And it was a handicap. A handicap I don't want others to bear. There should be free public school for every child, no matter how poor. That, that's my goal. That's what I'm working for. I see. Meanwhile? Meanwhile, my main business is business. Till I've saved enough money. And then when the right day comes... But will it, John? People don't understand what you want to do. You've never told them. Instead, they're jealous of your wealth. They're trying to take it away from you. They're even beginning to call you a miser. I know. I know. I can't, I can't help it if I have enemies. It's just because of them that I can't explain. They, they wouldn't believe me. They'd say this is just another excuse for John McDonough to make more money. Oh, I've got to do what I must in my own way. Because there is no other way. But John McDonough is to pay a high price for his decision. He has enemies by the score. But friends? No, almost none. None except his trusted attorney and his own plantation slaves. They know the true character of John McDonough. Yes, come in. It's Julius, sir. Cash has told me uh, I was wanted. Yes, uh, something I'd like you to tell the men. Yes, Mr. McDonough. Julius, you've been a good and faithful servant to me. You've worked hard and you haven't complained. Well, uh, I haven't had nothing to complain of, sir. You're the, you're the best master any of us ever had, sir. I hope so, Julius, but the time has come when I no longer want to be your master or any man's master. Julius, I want you to tell the men that they can soon be free. Mr. McDonald. Tell them that if they wish to go back to Africa, I will provide them with means. Oh, oh no. No, Mr. McDonald, no. No? I don't care what the others do, but I'm not leaving you, sir. As long as I live, I'm still your old Julius. The years pass. Steamboats come to the Mississippi in ever-growing numbers. New Orleans waxes rich from a river trade. It's a city of rich men, and John McDonough is the richest. He's a millionaire who dresses in the shabbiest of clothes, who eats the cheapest of foods, and who walks miles upon miles through the streets of New Orleans in order to save the cost of a carriage. He is a man of purpose, but a man misunderstood and ridiculed. years pass by, and then one day John McDonough wanders aimlessly through one of the city's parks, park visited by New Orleans' best families and their children. John! John! Don't you recognize me, John? It's... it's Isabella, isn't it? Oh. Have I changed so much? No, no, you haven't. How is your husband? And uh, Alexander and Christine? My child, how did you know? Their names? I kept track. They're in school in Europe, aren't they? Yes, in Italy. Hmm. They must be just about the age of those two. No, no, a little older. Son, you always wanted to have children, didn't you? Yes. John, I... For so many years, I've wanted to see you again. I wanted to tell you that I was wrong. I... I thought my mother knew best. I was foolish. I should have fought for our happiness. Well, you, you couldn't help yourself, my dear. And in the end, you found another happiness. But you... Yes, yes, even I. Perhaps it's been because of you. Uh, what we wanted and uh, never had, uh, that I found my purpose in life. Your purpose? Well, you'll know someday, Isabella, and you'll understand. And I, I hope you'll be proud. <laughs> Thank you.
The year's 1850 and John McDonough's 71. He calls his attorney to his bedside for their last conference. If you feel strong enough, John, perhaps we'd better go over this list of your properties. No, that won't be necessary. All I want to know is that there is enough for everything that I planned. There he is. And enough for the children of New Orleans? Yes, John. And Baltimore? More than enough. You've striven all your life for this, John, through persecution and misunderstanding. Now... You can make everything possible. You're one of the largest landowners in the entire world. Yes. Providence has been very kind to me, and now I'm ready. Will you uh, take down these notes? Mm, of course, John. Uh, to the city of New Orleans and to Baltimore, the city of my birth. I bequeath my entire fortune equally divided. With it, three public schools are to be built. Schools to which the poor may send their children, boys and girls of all ages and creeds. Schools to teach the true spirit of America, freedom and uh, tolerance and hope. John, no, let me finish. When I am buried, let there be no eulogy, but uh, perhaps as a small favor, uh, the little children shall sometimes come and plant a few flowers about my grave. For I have loved children with the love of a father. Misunderstood during his lifetime, John McDonough's generosity and vision of a public school system free and available to all was to be accepted with gratitude by the cities of New Orleans and Baltimore. Scores of schools were built, including the famed McDonough Institute. A hundred years have passed, and still John McDonough's name lives in the hearts of the school children of New Orleans. There, on the first Friday of every May, on May Day of this year, the school teachers lead the boys and girls of New Orleans past a simple marble column standing in Lafayette Square. All right, Carl. Louise. Henry. As each school boy and each school girl passes, he places a single flower at the base of the mountain. Clara. A rose, a violet, Clara. daisy, a carnation. Clara. A simple ceremony in tribute to a great American, John McDonough. Just a minute, I'll tell you about our story for next week and why you won't want to miss the exciting true story of the person we're honoring on the Hallmark Hall of Fame next week. But first, here's Frank Goss. He wants to honor some ladies you'll be honoring soon yourselves. You recall those famous words by Abraham Lincoln, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. It's a beautiful tribute and one that's especially appropriate to the season for Mother's Day will soon be here. All of us like to honor our mothers on the second Sunday in May with warm, affectionate greetings that come from the heart. And that's why I think you'll appreciate the Hallmark Mother's Day cards which have just arrived at fine stores across the country. From the new Hallmark collection, you can choose exactly the right card to please your mother best. And special Mother's Day cards, too, for your grandmother, a favorite aunt, or one who has been like a mother to you. You'll find colors that delight the eye and words that say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. So one day soon, why not select all the kinds of Mother's Day cards you'll want to send on the 10th of May? You can be sure of it. The hallmark and crown on the back of each card you mail will carry an extra measure of joy. For it means always, you'll care enough to send the very best. 
And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Oh, no, that's splendid, Frank. Thank you, thank you. That's fine. To remember grandmothers, favorite aunts, or perhaps some other wonderful lady on Mother's Day. I know on that day I always remember a very remarkable lady who was very close to me and helped bring me up. My grandmother, Mrs. John Drew. You may have read a little story I wrote about her in a chapter of my book called Blue Barrymore. Well, my grandmother made her stage debut in 1821 at the age of 12 months. Her role was, fittingly enough, that of a crying baby. But I can remember her telling me the story of that debut. Cry, indeed, I wouldn't do it, she said. I crowed aloud with joy, and from that moment to this, the sight of audiences has filled me with joy. And I expect it will do so until the last glimpse I get of them. <laughs> And she did go on entertaining audiences over 70 years. Yeah, she was a wonderful person. Well, now, I'd better stop reminiscing and, and tell you about next week's story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. It's the exciting and factual story of a young farmer who refused to give in to the dreaded crop disease, wheat rust, and how he saved this great American crop from total destruction. Um, I'm sure you want to be listening. Our Hallmark Hall of Fame is every Sunday. Our producer, director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by Leonard Sinclair. Well, until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. The part of John McDonough was played by Lamont Johnson. Lorene Tuttle was featured as Isabella. Others in our cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Barbara Jean Wong, Lillian Sabin, Richard Beals, Peter Leaves, and Ted DeCorsio. Every Sunday, Hallmark cards presents two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. The Hallmark Hall of Fame, on radio with host Lionel Barrymore, and on television with Miss Sarah Churchill. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we honor Mark Carlton on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the PBS Radio Network. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri.